Thank you so much for joining us here at the Winter Show. This is the, uh, my name is Helen Allen. I'm the executive director of the show. And this is the 69th annual Winter Show. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, all proceeds, we are owned by, uh, and all proceeds benefit Eastside House Settlement, one of New York's most important uh, community service organizations located in the South Bronx. So thank you for your support. We're thrilled to have with us today dear friends of the show. Uh, we're doing this partnership. We're doing this lecture in partnership with Asia Week New York. So uh, we encourage you all to uh, make sure that you sign up and attend their uh, programs in March. But with us today we have Alice Cooney Freelinghausen from the Met, Dessa Goddard, who's chair of uh, Asia Week, and uh, Thomas Denenberg from the Shelburne. And without further ado, we're going to start talking about the Havemeyers. We can't wait. Thank you. Well, then I don't have to introduce you at all. <laughs> <laughs> First, um, we are, we're very um, delighted to have a number of members of the Havemeyer family here. How many are here? Could you raise your hands? Do you, know, do you all know each other? <laughs> You just <laughs> met. <laughs> terrific, terrific. Well, thank you very, very much for attending, and we're delighted to have such a large audience. Uh, it's been a while since we've had um, a live discussion rather than a webinar, so this is a uh, marvelous opportunity for all of us. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Partners in Life in Art, the spectacular collections of the Havemeyer family. And as you know, the Havemeyers had a unique partnership among Gilded Age collectors. They had separate tastes and conjoined tastes, and through the association and marriage of both Louisine and H.O. Havemeyer, they built these marvelous collections that now are housed in the Met and in the Shelburne Museum. Um, today we're going to talk about their experiences in, in their life and how it helped form their disparate and uh, joint tastes in both Tiffany Glass, Tiffany is interest in Tiffany. Of course, their spectacular collection of impressionist paintings and their fascination with Chinese and Japanese works of art. Prints, um, uh, ceramics, screens, metalwork, etc. And how those tastes actually both reflected and were different from those of their uh, wealthy peers during the Gilded Age. Then we're going to be talking about the relationship between Louisine and her daughter, Electra. Um, and we're going to develop, delve into their uh, different approaches to collecting and also similar approaches to collecting and how those collections actually then formed the, um, the Met Museum collection and the Havemeyer and the Shelburne Museum collection in Vermont. So you all have seen um, Tom <laughs> and um, Nani, as we call her, um, uh, bio. So I, um, I'm going to not actually introduce the, them any further. I'm just going to, we're just going to start off with um, Nani. Why don't you introduce the Havemeyer principles and talk, with them, and talk with us about the Splendid Legacy exhibition and how it reflected their development as collectors. Well, first let me say how delighted I am to be here today for the Winter Antique Show's program and to speak with Dessa and Tom on a subject that's actually very near and dear to my heart. Um, so, we'll, I, so I'm going to start off with Louisine and H.O. Havemeyer, Harry as he, as he was called, um, here seated in a wonderful photograph taken in Paris. And my... Um, sort of primary connection came through a unique invitation I had from director Philippe de Montebello to co-curate with Gary Tintero at the Met an exhibition which we titled Splendid Legacy, the Havemeyer Collection. And it was, it was an extraordinary experience for me as a curator to work with um, curators, literally, oh, how many? I think there are like 25 curators from 12 different um, curatorial departments. The, it, we, it was the largest exhibition in the last three decades. I know that's hard to believe. It um, was 450 works of art. 
many of them or the majority of them from the Met itself. So it really was, it, it was, it was quite a, an extraordinary um, um, exhibition. I just show you a couple of gallery views, one with a um, collection of, from their Japanese screens, a, a, a little vignette um, that we put together to sort of evoke their, their house in New York. Um, a couple more, one to show you some of the extraordinary Monets and, and French modern painting, and then some of the Chinese porcelains that were part of their that are were part of their collection. But we really have to start with young Louisine, who went to Paris in 1874 with her mother and sisters, and it was it was then that she met the American painter Mary Cassatt. Now, this painting is painted a few years later by the sort of Parisian um, painter named Jean-Jacques Henner. And I think, I think it's quite wonderful because it kind of shows her at that moment when she's just sort of seeing art in, in, with these sort of bright eyes and, and alert expression, ready to soak it up, literally soak it up. And that is, that's really what she did. She met Mary Cassatt, who was an extraordinarily important influence on her and on her and their collecting. Here you see Mary Cassatt in a self-portrait of hers that Louisine did purchase. It's now at the Met. And um, Mary Cassatt was 10 years older than, than Louisine, but they formed together not just, um, not just a, a kind of artistic relationship, but also a close friendship as well. <clears throat> and it was Cassatt who, in 1877, took her to see her first work of Edgar Degas. And, when she, and she purchased it, this work here, um, which is actually at the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, the very first work purchased by, of Degas by an American collector and, and brought to this country. It, um, Degas was, was an artist who was particularly, um, whom Cassatt particularly loved and, and respected, and, and, and Louisine Havemeyer really followed suit with that. But at the time she bought this, she said, and she bought it for a hundred, what was the equivalent of a hundred dollars. And at the time, she had to sort of scrape together her, her purse money at the time, maybe borrowing from her sisters and the like. But she said she also wanted a Monet and a Pissarro. And so this is what you see on the screen are her first Monet, the drawbridge, a wonderful painting that is actually at the Shelburne Museum. And on the right, Pissarro, a, a, a marvelous work by Pissarro in a kind of Japanese fan shape, but, but depicting the sort of French country peasant life that was so much a part of his, of his genre. But I mentioned that, that they were more than, than just um, art, an artistic, um, what, what are we calling this partnership? They really, uh, because they, they really were that. But as you can see, I think, in these two wonderful portraits that were painted in the mid-1890s when, when the Havemeyer family visited Cassatt in her country house outside of Paris, she painted her elder daughter, their elder daughter, Adeline on your left, and on your right, a marvelous double portrait of Louisine with the younger daughter, Electra, seated on her lap. And I think you, you know, what you see here, not only you do have that sort of the maternal subject matter that figures so strongly in Cassatt's work, but also those, those wonderfully sort of pensive expressions that, um, that she's imparted to these, to these two portraits. Now, interestingly enough, in spite of their long friendship and their, the advice that Cassatt gave, they actually purchased very few paintings by Cassatt. These are two of those. Um, and, and again, they do show that mother and child um, subject matter that, that, that she was so, known, so well known for and that wonderful sort of feeling. Um, between the, the two, these are, these are two really important ones that would then even figure later in 1915 when she joined um, um, Mary Cassatt in an exhibition to support women's suffrage. Mm. But just to, I, I just can't talk about the Havemars without giving you a bit of a run-through of some of their 
literally greatest hits, if you will. <laughs> um, mayonnaise, boating, some of these are so recognizable to you. And, and it's interesting, you may know them so well from the collection at the Met and, and a few other institutions, and including mm -hmm. Shelburne, but, but, but they're, not, they're not all in one room that bears the big name Havemeyer. So, so it sort of is useful to kind of think back a little bit on how they, how they got there. Um, Degas, as I mentioned, was, was the artist that, that Cassatt had the most um, sort of important relationship with, and, and Louisine Havemeyer was very, very much um, a, part of, a part of that as well. They ended up acquiring, I think it's some 62 works total by Edgar Degas, the largest assemblage by that artist in the world outside of Paris even, really extraordinary. Iconic works like the woman with the chrysanthemums and the milliner here, or um, examples of their dancers and bathers series here. One of the interesting things as a collector, I think, is that Louisine, who bought her first Degas in 1877 um, for $100, in 1912 she bought another Degas for a thousand times that. So she actually went with the market. She didn't, you know, many collectors, they'll buy up till a certain point and then they stop and might move to something else, but as it reaches a certain price. She had such conviction with this artist that she was willing to pay $100,000 at the time for this, um, for this work. And I don't, I can't tell you how many millions that would be to, in, today's, um, in today's world. Um, she also was very taken with Degas' sculptures and, and Degas refused to, and, and tried to, to buy from him um, his sculptures, but he, he wouldn't sell them, and it was not until after his death that these were cast posthumously, and she was able to buy a whole suite, um, a whole set of sculptures, including, of course, the 14-year-old dancer. Um, in Monet, uh, uh, again, a, a complete sort of sweep of the work of Monet from these wonderful early 1870s views up to a number of these wonderful series paintings where he just shows his incredible interest in light and color and light as it changes in different times of day. And I, I have to say that um, the exhibition gave me an opportunity to do something I had always wanted to do which was to put a case of their collection of Louis Tiffany blown glass, iridescent and opalescent glass, right next to these almost opalescent and iridescent um, mm -hmm. paintings by Monet, mm -hmm. um, which, which you can see here. So I was focused on Louisine because she really started this collecting of French moderns. And, but I should add that when they got married in 1883, they were a joint collecting couple. They looked at art together, they made decisions about art together, um, but they both came from, from different ends, if you will. Mm -hmm. Here is H.O. Havemeyer, called Harry, who, um, and I hope I'm not gonna get anything wrong, but Harry Havemeyer is in the audience today, who's the grandson of H.O. <laughs> Havemeyer, who has written wonderful books on, on his involvement in the sugar industry, et cetera. Um, so if I get anything wrong, he will correct me, I am quite sure. And <laughs> in any event, he made his fortune in the business of sugar refining and in 1887 consolidated some 12 um, sugar refineries in, into the American Sugar Refining Company. His great factory was in Williamsburg, which you see here across the Hudson River. And I just show you this wonderful trade card with its um, um, signature cubes that were then became literally the trademark of, of, this, um, of, of this company. But Harry Havemeyer, as I said, came at it a little differently. He was introduced to art when he was befriended the American painter Samuel Coleman, and together they went to the 1876 Centennial in Philadelphia. And Coleman introduced him especially to the works of art of Japan. And at the time, 
told him, here, you know, buy this collection of Japanese silks and I will one day make them into a ceiling for you, which you can't really see it very well on this slide because we don't really have a good image of the ceiling. But he did that for Havemeyer's library, seen here, and, and put it together as a, kind of, as, as a kind of mosaic. Well, his library was also called the Rembrandt Room because this was the room where he um, exhibited and displayed his old master paintings, including a number of Rembrandts. And I, I'm just going to, it, well, actually, I think you can see it in the, in the far right corner. But, um, <clears throat> but here you have on your left, I think probably the most famous Havemeyer Rembrandt, the portrait of Hermann Domer, who was, who was actually Rembrandt's framer. And it's, it's absolutely this sort of riveting, wonderful psychological face. Um, which, uh, next to the um, extraordinary, iconic Bronzino of a portrait of a young man, <clears throat> um, to just give you some sort of sense, they were, he was actively, actually this Rembrandt was one of his very first, if not the first Rembrandt he purchased, right um, not many years after he had formed the Sugar Trust, and he continued in collecting old masters, and this, this was something that, that he wasn't, um, this wasn't necessarily an avant-garde area to be collecting. It, it sort of conformed with many of his peers, although many of them were also buying, and many American collectors were really buying American paintings, and they were buying German contemporary paintings. Um, but but this, this was happily for all of us is where he, he end, ended up. But, but what he was taken with, and Samuel Coleman and the Centennial was so important for this introduction to Asian works of art, and I'm really, because this is not my specialty, I'm going to run through these. <laughs> Des is going to tell you a lot more about them. Um, but from Chinese lacquer work to Chinese, wonderful Chinese porcelains, um, you see here a selection of tea wares, which was a little bit more of the avant-garde taste, I would say. And, and at the time, he was buying these. This was a completely new subject for Louisine. Mm -hmm. And, and it was a, she, she were so grateful to her who wrote her wonderful, charming memoirs called 16, 16 to 60. And in it, she describes when her husband says, tells her about a shipment of, the, of these porcelains that are coming in, um, uh, these ceramics which are, which are going to be delivered. And would she open them up and sort them up and make a selection of those that would be on view and then the others they would put away for storage. And she describes opening up each box and each one was in its own wonderful silk bag. And after she was handling these very soft, beautiful, tiny objects, she, she definitely began to understand, appreciate, and really love them. I, you know, a collection of textiles, um, actually, have, Harry Havemeyer bought early on a, um, another collection of Japanese textiles, here a marvelous kimono, and I, I love to sort of show it next to this um, Japanese screen of theirs with these kimonos and wonderful silks hanging over it. Lacquerware, boxes, writing boxes, Netsuke, Japanese prints, famous, famous great wave and, and wonderful figural prints by Udamaro. And, and I show you here some of the metalwork, the Japanese sword fittings, sword and dagger fittings that um, became very, very popular in the late 19th century when, when sort of samurai were, were essentially abolished. Or, yes. um, so, so these decorative these decorative elements had great appeal to Westerners, and, and a number of them, including many artists, including Louis Tiffany and including Samuel Coleman, were also collecting them. And, and they're really fantastic with their different color metal appliques of insects and bugs and little frogs and crustaceans and gourds and the like. The kind of thing that was also collected by Tiffany and companies chief artistic um, designer, Edward C. Moore, the subject about which you're going to hear a lot more when that exhibition opens at the Met in 2024. <laughs> um, but, but you can see here how it really inspired Moore's work. The, again, those applique of insects and, and, and sea creatures and, and the like in different color metals. This service was the service that 
as Louisine described it in notes to her children, she said, father, talking about Harry, father had more, Edward C. Moore, make this, design this specially for me. So we know it dates to 1883, and you can see on the back side of each piece these wonderful sort of conjoined initials, almost Art Nouveau, L-W-E, so they're her unmarried name initials, Louisine Waldron Elder. So it's great to have a very specific date for that as well. Um, but it was really the exhibition at, um, at the Met where I became um, really much more tuned in and understanding and acquainted with the Shelburne Museum because at the time, Shelburne was the largest institutional, well, the largest lender period to the exhibition Splendid Legacy. And in my role, I spent, I'll never forget, coming up um, with a team of curators. I think there were eight of us who flew up just for the day. I, of course, you know, knew it well from the Americana um, side of things, or, or knew of it well um, from the Americana side of things, but, but hadn't really spent that much time there. So it was really my interaction with the staff and the curators and the collection that, that I, became, um, I became such a, a, a fan and, 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 and the like of, of Shelburne Museum and its wonderful collections, and including some of those that we borrowed for the exhibition. But I'm gonna pass yeah. this on to Tom to Here you go. speak. Here you go. <laughs> Nani, thank you. And, um, we have this ritual at Shelburne Museum. There's a, the Electra Havemeyer Webb Memorial Building right in the center of campus. And whenever you know, there's a VIP coming, someone from Europe, we take them into this building. And they usually cross the threshold and refuse to believe these are real. Um, and it takes a little while to kind of do a little pre-visit counseling to, to kind of, because you, you walk you know, through a field in an idealized Vermont town into this building, and then you come across some of the most important Impressionist paintings in America. Um, so the Saman by Manet, of course, here. Um, and this is the one that really kind of knocks people back on their heels, the Grand it's Canal, incredible. Venice by Manet. There are only a handful of Venetian uh, Manets, and this is the one that, that always um, kind of you know, takes the, the hair up on the back of your neck a little bit when you stand, stand in front of it. Um, I'm not sure how well, many I'm gonna, have. I'm Please, gonna, go. I'm yes. just going to say one thing about that painting. It was that painting that... Um, that prompted a comment by Louisine when somebody asked her, Would you, wouldn't you rather have a, a string of pearls than, than <laughs> this? And she said, I'd far rather have something made by a man than made by an oyster. <laughs> <laughs> she did, however, get a string of pearls, as I she understand did. it, a magnificent <laughs> string of pearls, yes, as I recall. Yes. We, we have a, a montage of images of Electra Webb in our new building, the Pizzagalli Center, and we we put it up when we opened the building in 2013. I forgot if there are eight or 10 of them. It's mm -hmm. sort of a voyage of life. And she has the pearls in every one of them. Uh, so oh. it doesn't matter if she's standing in a tent, if she's, you know, wherever she is, <laughs> you know, in her field gear or her finery, she's, she's wearing, the, wearing the pearls. Um, but here we go. I'll hand that back, back. to you. Wait here. Um, well, one of the things we were talking about when the three of us were, were thinking about yes. this was areas in which these individuals were true pioneers. Right, and I was going to ask you that. Okay. Yes, you know, they, they collected in this area where, which was a, a marvelous and interesting and, and actually somewhat avant-garde area to collect. However, what else did they collect that was con really considered by you to be avant-garde? Well, and I'll just, I'll just kind of link back to some of the French moderns because of course that really was avant-garde, but in some of the choices they made, right they were somewhat startling, like this mané of a masked ball where um, the women are masked and are likely not spouses of the gentlemen wearing top hats. <laughs> yes. and, and somebody has commented about the pink slippered leg dangling from the balcony above that it's almost like a trade sign for what might be happening here, and so Louisine felt that this wasn't something that she could that she could keep downstairs in her gallery in the home, but had to be moved upstairs to the more private 
areas to be seen. And, and similarly yes. um, is this large, we all must know this grand Corbet woman with a parrot, which, which was held, it was in the gallery of, of the Parisian gallerist Durand Ruel, which was a gallery from whom they purchased many of their paintings. And they were just, it hadn't sold, it was just about to go back to Paris. And Louisine pleaded with Harry saying, you know, we must, we must have this, and we must have it not to hang in our home, but for, for the public, for the future, mm -hmm. for future students mm -hmm. and artists to be able to study. And so it did, um, in fact, it went on loan. I don't, there's a big question, you know, the story is that it was in some closet. I can't imagine a closet big enough, but, um, but that it went on loan to the Met, I think in 1912, and it actually never left the Met. <laughs> Um, but other areas where they were yes. pioneering were in their collecting of Spanish art. And, and this is something that it's hard for us to imagine today. There were no books on Spanish art. There weren't lectures on Spanish art. This was really um, pioneering. They would go with Mary Cassatt to Spain, and they didn't, nobody spoke Spanish. They were trying to find their way through these country, um, hilly, hilly towns to locate these. And, and ended up with, with obviously two of the greatest El Grecos ever painted, the cardinal on your right, and of course the view of Toledo on your left. And similarly, they purchased many works by Goya. They were, this was not Mary Cassatt's specialty in terms of her connoisseurship. And unfortunately, many of the Goyas that they bought have turned out not to be Goyas, and in fact, the very famous Mahas on the balcony here, um, which we can, we can talk about that still um, is, there are many who have raised questions about the um, attribution of that to Goya, but certainly Goya was extremely important on, in his influence on Manet, as you see in this Mademoiselle Victorine image on your left. But also, they were sort of following the artistic tastes of the day, artistic tastes of people like Edward Seymour, people like Samuel Coleman and Louis Tiffany in collecting Islamic works of art, wonderful glazed works of art, luster pieces, um, such as those seen here. Mm. Well, speaking of this, let's, let's then move on to the uh, commissioning of their house. And you know their idea to hire Coleman and Tiffany to design this spectacular house in 1886, correct? 91. 91. Okay. Um, here, I just this is a slide to show you kind of their neighbors, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, they're here, but they're also here with Pierpont Morgan and William H. Vanderbilt and the like, who were all um, they were all decorating their houses. Pretty much the same, we're talking about similar decades. You know, some of them are early 80s, Havemeyer's in early 90s. Many of these had lived down in the 30s or 40s and then moved up to the more fashionable addresses on Fifth Avenue. And the Havemeyer's built this house at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 66th Street, 186th Street. It's relatively, compared to their peers, it's actually relatively modest on the outside a kind of retarded tear, almost um, um, Romanesque revival style, which wouldn't prepare you for what you were to see inside. The house, they, they hired Louis Tiffany in partnership with Samuel Coleman to completely decorate the interiors That's of their amazing. home. Mm -hmm. Just this was extraordinary. They were given virtually carte blanche to do so. You see here, this is their entrance hall. All of those surfaces in wood that we had color images, mm -hmm. but all those surfaces are actually iridescent glass mosaic, opalescent and iridescent glass mosaics. If you look at the mosaic frieze, you can see it in sort of the far right of the slide. Um, you mm -hmm. can see two panels of that frieze mm -hmm. on your left. There, there are three panels plus the wonderful prototype panel which we have, which was a gift of Paul Nassau, um, of Lillian Nassau, um, some years ago together. And here with the overmantel mosaic, 
of paired peacocks and their lustrous iridescent sort of sheen, oily sheen of their peacock feathers, but with that golden scroll against a blue mosaic background, very, I mean, I think very Islamic in its inspiration as well. But the whole house was, was really, and I'm only just showing you a little bit, I could speak for hours on this house. And so um, this is one image of their art gallery with their very famous hanging staircase, oh. literally strung like a necklace from one side to the other. And a detail there of the balustrade of that with its gilt metalwork design embedded with little tiny opalescent paisley shaped jewels. It was said that when you walked on it, the little, um, there was a little glass and metal fringe that clinked as you walked mm. on this staircase. <laughs> no sneaking around here. No <laughs> sneaking around here. Um, the music room, too, um, was, was an important room. Here, I just show you a close-up of that music room with a close-up. I'm sorry. Um, I guess I didn't put a full, full on piece here of the unusual furniture. There's very little furniture that survives from this house, sadly. But what does survive of the music room is at the Shelburne Museum. And this is just one detail to show you this carving, which relates very closely to, to that that, um, that his one-time partner, Lockwood de Forest, was, having, was commissioning in Ahmedabad, India, to bring home mm -hmm. and decorate um, homes and make, make yeah. furniture as well. Um, here's the, the, an overall of the room with this almost kinetic chandelier, which was inspired by Queen Anne's lace. Sort of look as if you, I mean, she describes it beautifully, the wild carrot, it looks like you've just picked a bouquet of it and strung it on our, on our ceiling here. Um, but the Havemeyers were not just great patrons of Tiffany as an interior decorator, but also of his artwork, and in particular, his blown glass, just a selection of which I show you here. They were collecting at the very moment when Tiffany was experimenting with making blown glass. He started in 1893. Three years later, they were giving a collection, a really important collection, to the Metropolitan Museum. They were giving it not to the American wing, which didn't exist. They were giving it as modern art mm -hmm. and for its beauty. And I have no doubt that Tiffany had select, made the selection for them or with them in order to best represent what he felt um, was, were some of his very best work. So I just show you a couple of them. And, and here, pairing it with collections that Moore and Tiffany and Havemeyer and the Havemeyers were also collecting ancient art, and you just see that influence on um, some of the Tiffany vases, the ancient, the um, Roman glass on the left, and and the Tiffany on the right. Similarly, here with this kind of luster, luster um, decoration on on that piece here. And then I'll just this was this was kind of my my <laughs> favorite pairing of of looking at Tiffany glass with Shelburne's. Mm -hmm. um, Ice, ice flows. Ice flows, ice flows right. Yes, exactly. But there, it was their music room, which was really their collection. All the walls were sheathed in Japanese silks. And if you can see the case in the background, it is full of their Asian works of art. And, and that was a very important part of their collection. And Dessa, Dessa knows I, a little I, bit about I'll that. I'll talk a little <laughs> bit about this. Um, basically what I want to do, although Louisine actually first um, saw uh, Chinese art actually in um, Whistler's study, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. In the 1960s, she saw, apparently he was using props like a Hawthorne vase, a blue and white, uh, cracked ice and prunus vase, and also a Japanese, um, I guess, a Jap big Japanese bronze. And she and Whistler had quite an interesting relationship. She was extremely <laughs> fond of him. And this is when she was in her late teens or early 20s. So she separately had an interest or became interested in Japanese art. And then, of course, um, um, H.O. Havemeyer said that um, you know, he started collecting, actually, at the um, Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition. So, but I wanted to set the stage by talking about the Havemeyers in, in context with other collectors of the Gilded Age. 
And it wasn't really until the late 19th century when, um, when America became aware of Asian art. Although there were China trades, um, um, shipments to America in the early 19th century, and some disparate collectors of Chinese art, really Asian art sprung on the stage with the international exhibitions, um, including the Philadelphia Exhibition of 1876. And here we show the Japanese room, which um, Harry Havemeyer <clears throat> undoubtedly explored and supposedly bought in the carloads. Not no. just, <laughs> not just uh, textiles, right. no, but was... Japanese bronzes, yeah, yeah. Japanese inro, some netsuke, some um, suba. He really bought quite a bit yeah. with, when he went with Coleman to the uh, Philadelphia Exposition. Um, at this point, um, Japan was really, really interested in marketing itself to the West. Uh, the Meiji government, after 260 years of isolation, the Meiji government sponsored programs of educational, scholarly <coughs> interchange, and three people in particular who were responsible for actually building some of the major collections of Japanese art in America are shown here. That's Edward Sylvester Morse on the left, um, uh, William Sturgis Bigelow in the center, and Ernest Fanalosa on the right. And all of these people spent uh, more than a decade in Japan, um, collected things. Morse collected, was, uh, he was a zoologist. He collected, oops, excuse me, whoops, thank you very much. He collected um, uh, Japanese ceramics, and he uh, gave 5,000 people pieces in 1892 to the Boston Museum of Art. You had, um, you had uh, Mr. Bigelow, who actually entered Japan in 1882. He became a Buddhist. He went back in, um, in, to Boston, and in 1911, he gave his collection of over 15,000 pieces of Chinese and Japanese works of art and over 40,000 Japanese prints. <laughs> Mm. Okay. Then you have um, Ernest Fenelosa, who was actually a protege of both Bigelow um, and, uh, <clears throat> um, well, of Bigelow in particular. He, uh, he actually went in 19, he spent 12 years at, in Japan. He l loved both Chinese and Japanese art, their influence, etc. He became the first director, actually, when he returned of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. He composed a collection that he sold to Charles Weld that ended up in Boston. So among these three people, they actually built some seminal collections, particularly in the Boston area. But Fenelosa, in particular, was interested in both Chinese and Japanese works of art and recognized the influence that China actually had in, you know, in the course of, of Japanese art. And he was a profound influence and advisor on Charles, uh, for Charles Freer, Charles Lyne Freer, and also the Havemeyers. Mm -hmm. So, also, however, in an earlier context, we have William Walters, who was a Confederate sympathizer, moved to London uh, in the middle of the Civil War, went to the Crystal Palace, bought some Chinese art and Japanese art there, with his compa compatriot Samuel Avery, also became involved in a couple of Paris exhibitions. Avery was a big collector of Chinese porcelains. And through Avery's influence, Walters both bought Chinese art and Japanese art. At the Philadelphia uh, Centennial, he bought 80 pieces of Chinese porcelain. And he bought over 400 objects of Japanese works of art, which you see in the Walters gallery here. These are photos from the uh, late um, 1880s. Of course, here you have Charles Lang Freer, and his uh, big, um, um, he was a patron and close friend of James McNeil Whistler. It was actually Whistler who got Freer in, the, in his budding youth to, well, in his 30s, to buy, to form a collection of Japanese prints. And it was Fenelosa who said, sell your Japanese prints and buy Chinese art, which Freer did. 
And um, this, is, this is actually a remaining um, work. This isn't a print. This is a fantastic painting by Katsushika Hokusai of Boy Looking at Mount Fuji. There is still, of course, a, a large collection of Japanese prints at the Freer uh, National Museum of Asian Art in Washington, D.C. Um, but Freer, of course, then went on to collect the marvelous pieces and huge, formed this huge collection of Chinese works of art, which he gave to the nation in 1906. Um, the Havemeyers, as I said, were, um, Harry bought, a, you know, as they say, carloads. It was quoted as carloads of things in the, in the uh, Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition. But they were actually also, you know, a member of their class. Mm -hmm. So they were influenced by things that other people did. This is Vanderbilt's um, Japanese study, which is full of Japanese art, which he also he was a big collector of Japanese art here. This is not Louisine's taste, however. <laughs> she would not have organized things like this. This is Herder Brothers. <laughs> yes, this is Herder Brothers. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then, of course, the influence of, of, of J.P. Morgan, who also bought in very large quantities, but was very interested in, in both Chinese art as well as everything else. Um, but they also went to and attended auctions, and they, you know, they were competitive people. So when, um, when Walters bought his collection of peach blooms, and he bought this marvelous three-ring peach bloom vase collection period, um, for a reputed $18,000 in the 1880s. Yes. Um, yes. Um, Harry and Louisine decided, okay, we've got to buy some peach bloom. So this ended up where they bought 36 pieces of, of peach bloom. And they became very interested in underglazed copper red. You know, they have some marvelous pieces at the Met, including this Chenlong Markham period, a monk's cap ewer. Um, they, they were influenced by just a number of, of different forces among uh, people in who were their compatriots and, and um, members of their wealthy class. But they were inveterate travelers. They went to France on numerous occasions and developed a very close friendship through Fenelosa with Samuel Bing, here shown on the right who was a very close friend of um, Hayashi uh, Tadamasa. And it was through this relationship they bought a number of Japanese prints, predominantly in French taste, a little bit more mm -hmm. faded and very early. Um, not the later um, um, Hokusai, or excuse me, Hokusai and Hiroshi gaze. They form a that forms a very, very small part of the Met collection. But one of the jewels that they did purchase was Hayashi's uh, Spring Rain collection. Album, it's a, three, a set of three albums of 492 surimono. Surimono are privately published prints that basically flourished, that, that venue, that, that medium flourished between about uh, 1790 and 1830, um, that were actually produced for poetry clubs. And, this album of 492 absolutely fantastic pieces predominantly were composed by, um, or were published and designed by Kubo Shunman, who was the greatest surimono collector. But they're over, Hayashi put together these albums and they were purchased by the Havemeyers and are at the Met and they're just spectacular examples that have been written about um, in a number of a number of uh, scholarly articles. Here's another um, two. This is, uh, these are two Shunman prints, or Surimono. As I, as I said, the Havemeyers were very, very interested in prints. Um, you know, probably an early influence of, of um, Freer and others, that, uh, people whom they knew in the auction business uh, when they would attend auctions. Uh, they, they actually, I think the Met has about 800 Japanese mm -hmm. prints, but again, probably mostly early, and some not in the greatest condition, but classic examples, particularly Udomaro, because Marie mm -hmm. Cassatt really liked Udomaro. Yeah. They also collected widely in the area of both China and Japan. Um, this is a marvelous Yuan Dynasty uh, painting um, that's, that's at the Met. Um, this is a Warring States inlaid vessel. Um, and a group of, of Japanese censors 
and Chinese and Japanese censors. I think um, Harry bought these as Japanese. Oh, possibly. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. because yeah. These, yeah. these were well, much more widely, they were very yeah. widely available in Japan in, right. at the time of the Philadelphia show. Mm -hmm. And um, a number of these actually were auctioned off in 1930, but there's a, there's a corpus of this group of um, mm. wonderful later censors. Um, these are the Inro and the uh, Suzuribako that he probably bought at, at Philadelphia. Mm. This was something he did, he bought before his marriage to Louisine. And they're very, very decorative. You know, their reflection of the taste of the time where there was this interest in Ritsuo and, you know, Rimpa mm -hmm. subject matter and uh, designs. And also, again, this is your slide of the tsuba and sword fittings, which reflect this very sort of uh, ostentatious taste, but fantastic craftsmanship. Um, they also, actually, um, Japanese paintings were, paintings that were thought to be Japanese <laughs> were widely available. <laughs> Um, through the dealer circuit in the late 19th century. And um, this painting on the left, which was purchased, I believe, as a 19th century Japanese painting, yeah. is a fantastic yeah. uh, Korean 14th century Kisigarba painting. So, you know, a number of things have been reattributed, yeah. and they were lucky. They also bought a number of Japanese paintings that perhaps are not the greatest right. quality. Mm -hmm. But um, this, is, this is a jewel of the collection, along with some marvelous um, sword, swords. Um, you've already told the story about the, <laughs> the little brownies. That's quite all right. But again, um, you know, this is considered to be avant-garde by, you know, sort of adventurous for him to have done this. But this was Edward Morris's taste. Mm. This was the Boston taste that actually came in to the Boston area and to New York in the late 19th century. And so these were widely available on the market. And so between these and the brownies, you know, um, it, was, it was natural, although perhaps not, not the most um, you know, flashy things to, fling, thing to do for him or the most in vogue thing to do for him because he bought a lot of these early on in their marriage. Right. right. Well, and of course, I think we mentioned that that the Havemars, they were very interested in the decorative um, aspect of a lot of these works of art. Yes. And, and were somewhat chagrined when they went to visit Morse. Yes. Because they thought that it was just much more scientific in a way in terms of the collection. It wasn't displayed the way they would have thought was more appropriate. Right. Um, as I said, they actually were cl uh, relatively close with Charles Lightfrier. Mm -hmm. And a year before Mr. Havemeyer died, they went to visit him in late September of 1906, I think it was, and spent two days there and looked at his collection. And I think he probably sort of staged it so that they saw really the most marvelous mm -hmm. things. But they were so enthralled by the, the breadth of everything that he had collected. And um, uh, Louisine writes that her husband was really, really impressed. And, um, uh, you know, there is some taste that mm -hmm, is, mm -hmm. that you can see, because this is joint taste between Freer and, um, and the Havemeyers, because this is the, um, the Peacock Room in the Detroit residence. Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, there are analogies between their home yeah. um, 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 at 66th Street and the decoration here, uh, because the, I've noticed um, some photos of the gallery of their home um, at 66th, and they do have this gallery of monochromes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and also bronzes that are staged around, and yeah. it is reminiscent yeah. of what... Of Even the ceiling and the, the drop ceiling lighting and the fixtures. Drop, mm -hmm. Very, very, um, very analogous to, to Charles Lightfrier. So they were adventurous. They were very involved in what they were doing. They were very excited collectors, competitive collectors. And yes, both mainstream and, I would say, a bit avant-garde in their Asian taste as well. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to move on and talk about Louisine and Electra. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, their relationship with each other and, um, you know, the relationship between the two women here in some respects. Well, well I think it's, I think you've, you're getting a sense of, of, I hope, the personality of, of Louisine, and she really was 
an extraordinary figure. Um, her husband died in 1907, and she carried on in collecting both in terms of her of, of his tastes and hers. Um, but it also gave her a little bit, perhaps, more freedom um, to express herself in other areas, one of which was that she was an ardent suffragist. And this is something that probably, had she been had her husband still been alive, she might not have felt that she could be out there in the way that she ended up being. She, like, and, and Mary Cassatt was, was likewise a, a very, very ardent suffragist, and the two of them worked tirelessly to try to get the vote for women. And as I, I mentioned in 1915, they staged a uh, benefit exhibition of the work of Cassatt and Degas together. Um, Louisine was the primary lender. She wrote the catalog. She gave the speech at the opening. And the um, American Women's Party, she was, she was, she was um, re whether she was, a, I can't remember whether she was a founder or whether she was just an early member, but they latched onto her as a real spokesperson for the party. And you can see here on the left a wonderful slide, which I think comes from you, Harry. Um, of her giving one of her many, many lectures. She traveled on their train across the country. She marched in Washington the day before the vote was to take place in 1919, was arrested with many of the other women, went to jail. Um, you see here this, I love the slide on the right, which uh, the image on the right where she's holding the torch of, the symbolic torch of victory in a tugboat in New York Harbor, passing it on to the, 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 part, the women's party in New Jersey. Um, so you can see her lunging across with her great sash, which still exists. Um, and, and so she, she had this, this you know, very, very strong, independent-minded um, streak um, to her, which, which I think come, comes across um, right here. I can't remember what our next slide is. but Beg your pardon? Well, 1919 was was when she went to jail. Um, but I think I think this may have been 1916 on the right. Um, you know, they were it was it was years they were working on this. I think maybe the earliest was 1913 mm -hmm. when she became involved with the American Women's Party. And the vote happened in 1920. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, and so here we are with Electra as a as a as a young girl, and I'm sort of bemoaning that we didn't put in the slide of Electra with the large bear she shot. Because <laughs> she too was a woman of some force, <laughs> yeah. which Tom's gonna tell you about. And, and this work by Cassatt that we've already seen briefly becomes a little bit of a Rosetta Stone for understanding mm -hmm. the, the mother-daughter relationship. This is, of course, the six-year-old Electra on her mother's lap by, by Cassatt. Um, those of you with young people in your life know that sometimes intergenerational alignment proves elusive. <laughs> and, um, and I think the, the story that best represents um, this with Electra and her mother was the, the teenage Electra Havemeyer um, was traveling through a city in Connecticut um, and um, asked the driver to pull over and acquired from a, you know, an antique store, probably a junk store, um, what we would call a tobaccoist figure today, but a few years ago we would have called a cigar store Indian. And she brought it home and presented it to her mother. And her mother looks at her and says, oh, Electra, what have you done? <laughs> um, so it's a little hard for us in 2023 to kind of wind the clock backwards oh, yes. and think that collecting Americana would be an avant-garde activity, especially for a young woman who you know, traveled the world with her parents. Um, and I love the, the image on the left there because we're, we're used to seeing her as an older individual at, at Shelburne uh, Museum. Mm -hmm. um, and grew up with you know, remarkable things. Um, it's also a little hard to you know, think through this idea that collecting Impressionist painting was an avant-garde activity at one <laughs> <Right>. point <laughs> um, in life. And Nani you know, correctly mentioned you know, the, the, the kind of eye for seriality um, mm -hmm. that Louisine mm -hmm. and H.O. were so fond of, the mm -hmm. ice flow paintings, of which there's several, the uh, snow effects, mm -hmm. um, the grain stack paintings that you see here. But 
The paintings that made their way eventually to Shelburne Museum, and we'll, we'll talk about this for a few moments here, um, I think there's, there's sort of a code to them, hmm. which are they're the paintings that Electra kept from her mother's collection. Mm -hmm. So the ice flow painting at Shelburne is larger than most. There are plenty of grain stack paintings, but snow is unusual, and the double is a little unusual. Hmm. So, that, so each has a slight kind of um, you know, lens through which we, we might see it. Um, I'd ask you just for a moment, kind of in your mind's eye, take an image of this, snow effects, and we're gonna come back to it a couple of times um, because <laughs> okay. it's, gonna be, it's gonna be important um, to <laughs> us. So the, the transition to Americana as an avant-garde activity, I would argue, happens at Brick House on Shelburne Farms. Electra uh, Havemeyer, born in 1888, marries a fellow named J. Watson Webb in um, 1910, and about three years later is given by his parents a very simple vernacular farmhouse on Shelburne Farms. Shelburne Farms was a 3,000 acre estate that was assembled in 1886. Um, I'm a little slow, so it took me several years to realize farms is plural. So what they did is they purchased a number of these fallow farms. After the Civil War, population in Vermont had dipped, agriculture had moved out west. There are all these farms which could be purchased at a fairly reasonable uh, uh, rate, and um, the Webb family did with the uh, idea that they were going to create a model farm, and this was a movement that kind of mm -hmm. swept mm -hmm. America in the late 19th century. Progressive farming, we're going to come up with a new agricultural model which we can teach people which will make northern New England um, sort of you know, useful in, in the economy um, again. So this very simple little um, um, brick farmhouse, um, very typical of what you would find in Shelburne, um, probably from the 1820s or so, um, was put on steroids by Electra Havemeyer Webb and, and her new husband using Cross and Cross, uh, an architecture firm from New York, who were um, acquaintances of Watson Webb um, from, from prep school. And it grows in 1917 and then in the 1930s, and it becomes um, sort of the, the prototype for the American country house. A fellow named Henry Francis DuPont went and spent the weekend in 1920 mm. and went home and started his own version of this. Mm. So I like to point out to the curators at Winterthur that they have a pretty good copy <laughs> of Brick House <laughs> down, down in Delaware. Um, and um, Electra Webb, from that original purchase of that original tobaccoist figure, um, developed what today we might diagnose as slightly pathological behavior. Um, <laughs> because she also had an eye for seriality and, and sort of, you know, buying something in great depth. If something is worth having, it's worth having plural, uh, many of. Um, so she acquires <laughs> numerous... Uh, cigar store Indians, this is their house in Long Island. You see um, Jay Watson Webb on the left, who's always looking a little dour in these <laughs> photographs, and Electra Webb, and a number of these other objects, um, the wonderful um, ten pins figures there, yeah. which um, were painted in the Index of American Design, so they're very, very well known, very um, famous today, um, and a number of other sort of... Uh, um, sort of genres that Electra Webb collected in throughout. And this gives you just a little sense of the aesthetic that would have been at play, not only on Long Island, um, but at Brick House on Shelburne Farms. Um, 1947 is the moment of inflection um, for my part of this story, which is when Electra Webb calves off um, about 150 acres from that 3,000 acres um, and purchases some other land and starts a museum. Um, there's a wonderful series of letters, exchange of letters back and forth with the president of Colonial Williamsburg. Oh. Mm -hmm. And um, to read them, you can't help but think that this fellow is being a little shirty, a little starchy with her. And her <laughs> responses back, you know, are equally, you know, this is like a tennis match. She, she volleys right back <laughs> with him. And so he sends a letter, well, what is this museum you're starting in Vermont? And she sends back... Uh, you know, message, it will be an educational project varied and alive. So in doing so, she's kind of saying, well, your, your museum, your Rockefeller Museum is cast in amber. You've got you know, first person interpretation, but we're doing something very different. Um, and she moves all of these buildings from upstate New York and Vermont onto um, the campus and creates this idealized village. Unlike 
Williamsburg or Sturbridge or the nascent Plymouth Plantation, others. Um, Electra Webb was not terribly interested in an archaeological or historical uh, interpretation. There really aren't period rooms. What it is is a landscape of deeply immersive experiences with specific collections. Um, she acquires um, marvelous um, examples from uh, Maxim Karolik from Edith Halpert, who is the principal of the Downtown Gallery. I hope some of you saw that wonderful exhibition at the Jewish Museum a couple of years ago, just before pandemic on Edith Halpert. It was one of my all-time favorites. Um, on the role that certain women played in defining folk art as an aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Electra Webb, Edith Halpert, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, mm -hmm. um, among others. So things like the William Matthew Pryor Portraits of the Lost in 1843, um, perhaps the only signed pair of African-American sitters we know, very, very rare, mm -hmm. that Electra required. Um, those of you who've been to Shelburne Museum know that it was very aptly described in Antiques Magazine when it opened as a collection of collections. It's a cornucopia of decoys and lusterware and bandboxes, um, painted um, furniture, and each building has a theme at the museum. So rather than entering and coming across a period uh, interpretation, what you dive into is a forest of cigar store Indians, or a uh, pyramid, a Mayan pyramid of 300 bandboxes made out of 19th century um, um, wallpaper. And Electra Webb was a very hands-on president, curator, collector. And here you see that she has taken apart bandboxes um, because she has her carpenters turning them into um, paneling. So just like the earlier generation took Japanese silks and decoupage them, yeah, or whatever the word was, <laughs> went onto the ceiling, Electra yes. Webb is abstracting a 19th century bit of material culture and creating a useful past out of it by creating this paneling. And she did that at Brickhouse, and she did that um, in a gallery here, um, which she called Hatton Fragrance um, within mm. Variety Unit at Shelburne, um, Shelburne Museum. Um, we did an <laughs> exhibition uh, when we opened our new building in 2013, or our last building in 2013, there are 39 buildings at Shelburne Museum. Um, and, um, um, and we did an exhibition and we called it Color Pattern Whimsy Scale. And it was basically the rubric for understanding <laughs> Electra Havemeyer Webb's um, worldview, if you will. Um, here she is with the actor and comedian Zazu Pitts. Um, she was very, very fond of having her friends and family pose in this oversized rocking chair. Um, the rocking chair <laughs> itself was a trade sign. It was designed and fabricated to sit in a glazed cupola on top of a um, furniture factory. Oh. Um, and you see the oversized um, fork, so that was a pewterer's trade sign that would have hung um, in, a, in an urban um, environment. So Electra Webb in the kind of normal Boston rocker there on the web. <laughs> uh, Zazu Pitts on the right in the oversize. And there are numerous uh, images of, again, friends and family in those those rockers. Now I mentioned with the French paintings that eventually came to the museum um, upon Electra's death in 1960 that there's something of a code. But I think there's also a way of organizing Shelburne Museum in our heads today, which is in the very DNA of how Electra Webb um, collected. We you know, learned a few moments ago she never bought one of anything. I think there were seven Bard Brothers paintings in the collection um, when she turned it all over um, to the museum. And the, the way of understanding color, pattern, whimsy, scale in Shelburne Museum is she didn't just collect ship paintings, she collected the ship. <laughs> um, so in 1950, she purchased the last um, steam vessel on Lake Champlain, the Ticonderoga, laid down, the keel was laid down in 1905, completed in 1906. It had been in operation until 1950. Um, because Vermont is so tucked away. Um, it escaped being scrapped during World War II. Most of these vessels would have gone, gone away during, uh, during the conflict. Um, and she actually ran it on the lake for a series of years before she realized that that was not a sustainable idea. You couldn't really get the, st the staff anymore. Um, and those of you who mess around with boats know that they require <laughs> upkeep. Um, as, as does this. So um, again, remember, you know, she marries a web. Webs are Vanderbilts. Mm -hmm. Vanderbilts like to do things on railroad tracks. And so <laughs> they, um, they dig a basin in the side of Lake Champlain, and they create a parallel railroad track for three miles. And they drag the Ticonderoga overland three miles in the winter of 1955 
pulling it with a two and a half ton truck on these rail cars, and they stick it right in the middle of Shelburne Museum. Um, to complete the kind of new basin, um, she then goes and acquires from the um, lighthouse service a uh, surplus lighthouse from Colchester Reef in Vermont, rescues that and places it next to her um, boat. So again, you know, scale. It isn't just a question of ship paintings, um, it's the ship. Now, when it comes to ship paintings um, and those French paintings and some other um, works that we've already seen, what sets Shelburne Museum aside from most museums, um, and I do like to tease my colleagues about this, is both quality and quantity. Um, most good American collections will have a Fitzhenry Lane or two. I think we have 14. Um, and they include um, several of these, which are you know, marquees of that artist's um, work of portfolio. Um, um, there are also these kind of magic moments, if you will, in the collection. And at the end of Electra Havemeyer Webb's life, um, she um, begins working on what she called the new collection. Um, and she passes away in the... Um, the fall of 1960, and her assistant was cleaning up her desk and found a list that was entitled Moderns I Like. Hmm. Um, and I quite appreciate that list because it was really the, the roadmap for where she was going. Right before she passed away, she had the work of Andrew Wyeth, Yasuo Kuniyoshi, Charles Sheeler, Georgia O'Keeffe, mm -hmm. uh, Robert Laurent. Mm -hmm. um, she had all of the sort of the A-list painters of the 1940s and 50s mm -hmm. um, on approval at Shelburne Museum. Mm -hmm. Her son, Jay Watson Webb Jr., decides that this isn't sort of congruent with his mother's thinking. This is a late life, you know, kind of turn of <laughs> turn to the turn to the modern, yeah. which you know, is maybe, you know, a little too much for him. So he sends them back to the galleries, except for Soaring by Andrew Wyeth, hmm. that you see here. As you all know, depending where you are and how you ask the question, what's the most famous painting in American art history, you're either going to get Christina's World um, <laughs> down here or perhaps American Gothic at the Art Institute um, of Chicago. But this, this is one of the great Wyeths. Mm -hmm. In, in captivity. So I encourage you, when, if you haven't come to Shelburne Museum, when you do, take a close look um, at this. And it also is a little bit of a um, kind of a fulcrum, if you will, to something I want to talk about for just a couple of minutes, which is going back to that letter that Electra Webb sent to the Colonial Williamsburg president saying, you take care of you know, history, we're going to do something else here, and we are going to put people in contact with these you know, these objects, this material for a contemporary uh, purpose, um, it will be an educational project varied and alive. And we take that very seriously. So we do things like this. That's the um, Electra Havemeyer Webb Memorial Building. That's the home of the French paintings that you see at the top of the hill, which was built after she passed away in 1960 by her children to house those paintings that you've seen um, earlier. They're the kind of missing puzzle pieces from the Havemeyer collection at the Met, if you will. Um, and this is why Nani and her seven colleagues from the Met <laughs> took that plane flight <laughs> to Vermont um, to come, uh, you know, come, come look at the collections. But then that's the work of Aaron Stefan, who's a, um, a main sculptor, who, who had this cascade of classical columns which, which just kind of spill down the hillside. Um, so we like creating circumstances where we invite contemporary artists into the collection to intervene in the landscape, the historic landscape of Shelburne Museum, and do things that get people thinking a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, exhibitions um, tend to follow a certain kind of pattern where we take the historic and we um, ask contemporary artists to respond in some way. So this was an exhibition in 2016, 32 Degrees, The Art of Winter, which was basically about climate change. So it's a, you know, a multivalent project, if you will. It has a social purpose, but then it also has an aesthetic um, authority and power to it. And you'll see there is the Monet on the background, snow <laughs> effects. Um, on the left, you'll see a grid. You can't quite make it out, but those are snow globes by a contemporary artist. And there's mayhem going on in each of those different snow oh. globes. So, so the, the kind of relationship of these different painters and artists is something that we take to be very, very um, important. Mm. We also think it's critically important to work with young people. 
um, just as you know, uh, this show supports the work of the Eastside Settlement House, we have special relationships with the Shelburne Nursery School, which is right across the street from the museum. And I happened to be walking through one day, picking up my daughter, this is some years back, and noticed that they had just been to that 30 degree, 32 degrees <laughs> exhibition and they were all responding to the Monet mm-hmm. on the wall with mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. finger paints. And the other part of that exhibition that I liked so much was a German artist named Sonja Heinrichsen who came, and she also responded to that Monet with what she calls a snow drawing. So we took 48 staff members and we went out onto the golf course at Sugarbush and we executed one of her designs and shot it with a drone, which then oh, got, which then oh, got broadcast oh, back oh. in the gallery. So again, the, the sort of the, the hay grain stack form was what uh, inspired her. So here again, it's, you know, what is the role of the Havemeyer collection in the 1880s, 90s, throughout the 20th century at the Met? And then how do we invite artists to respond and bring Mm -hmm. something that may be a little new into our world? And I think that's really the great promise of this this material. I agree. We were going to talk about nope. you just coming. Yes. So we're going to, so we decided to close with just where are we now with the collections and what new discoveries of things that have been purchased in you know, the early part of the Havemeyer's collecting and where do we, what do we think of some of them now in terms of revisiting them? Nani? Well, I think, I think Des has talked um, certainly about how some of the Asian collections have been reevaluated and reattributed. Some are more important than we thought. Some are less important than right. we thought. Exactly. Some may not be important at all. R- Rembrandt, um, not Rembrandt. Right. <laughs> and, and, and I think it, it has prompted a number of people to be looking at the role of women collectors yes. in this era, which, which I think is um, very, very important. I think of um, you know, some new work. Laura Corey, who's an assistant, um, research assistant at the Met now, has done a a whole you know, new study and looking at Mary Cassatt and her mm-hmm. role in, in influencing these various women, women collectors and, and kind of you know, really shoring up her, her role as a, uh, as a kind of art broker, if, if you will, mm-hmm. That's right. um, which, which I think is, is, is very important. So there are a number, and then of course, you know, I mentioned the Mahas and the Balcony, but there's a lot of this, of this work, I think, going on. And then there are a few sort of discoveries, and some of you, may already know this story, but, but discoveries of, of works that were originally in the Havemeyer collection, um, which we didn't know at the time that we did the exhibition, mm. and we learned about later, and sometimes in the most unusual ways we learned, we learned about them later, which, um, and so I have to just share what is probably my most favorite curatorial story ever, which um, when we were out visiting, very, very, very close friend, um, god, godmother of our, of our then nine-year-old son um, on a summer weekend. We're saying goodbye in the driveway, and, and our son Henry sees a dragonfly flying around and gets excited. Of course, who doesn't get excited about a dragonfly? Well, Lyndon Havemeyer Wise said, Henry, if you think that's interesting, I have something to show you, and she disappeared. This is their summer house, by the way. Up in the, you know, behind her sweaters and her closet, came down, still standing on the driveway with this little, lovely little box with a little key, which she then proceeded to open. (laughs) And in that box with this wonderful green velvet lining, it says Tiffany & Co. at the top there, was this hair ornament. Um, we're still in the driveway. I've now fainted on the driveway, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I'd known from archival photographs at Tiffany & Company, one of the earliest pieces of jewelry that came mm-hmm. out of Tiffany's, Louis Tiffany's artistic jewelry production right about 1904. Um, very much, of course, nature-inspired in this whole, I like to think about it as this kind of moment of of sort of the ephemeral, the ephemeral in these dandelion puffs, one of which is partially already blown away, the rest mm. could any mm. minute, and the dragonflies, which are just a lit to fly off any 
um, at, at any moment. So that, that's probably the best discovery that I know of from, right. from you know, that followed, followed that, that, um, that, that exhibition. It, it actually is something that, that Lyndon would have shared with me, for sure, because the entire Havemeyer family were incredibly generous sort of going up to attics and basements when we were doing that exhibition to try to find anything at all. But she, she never associated it with Louisine. She associated it with her own grandmother who had given it to her mm -hmm. on a very similar moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, right. Right. so that's kind of my, oh, oh hold on. What's well, your story? This is, well, we put up. Oh. We put well, up the um, we, yeah. we, we, put, we, we put up the Edith Halpert show, and this was again at the Jewish Museum on the right. Um, but we had a, a wonderful relationship for a couple of years with the curator of that, Rebecca Shaken, who was coming and going from Shelburne Museum doing research. Um, and again, back to that idea of Electra Havemeyer Webb, you know, never buying one of anything. She would buy out the whole Edith Halpert exhibition. Okay. So that's that's the Edith Halpert. Um, Installation on the left, and Halpert, of course, was you know had two two floors in the down gallery. One of which she was selling folk art; the other was modernism. And so this was a installation of weather vanes. And it turns out that Electra Webb, I guess, if there were what nine or ten of them there, she she bought all but one. So she would walk in and just kind of say, "Okay, I'll take it." Um, so that gives us and several of them you can see. In yeah, the, several in of the them exhibition. you can see, which we then lent to the Jewish Museum for their their exhibition. Um, and um, so we, we quite liked that scholarship that Rebecca put forth in the catalog, because um, I think that really you know, re-centered the idea, as we talked about, of women collectors in the yes. 1920s and 30s and yes. into the 40s um, as being you know, perhaps a step ahead of some others, right. um, ahead of the boys and when it comes to this. When we were talking about doing this, this, um, this uh, conversation, I actually was up at the University of Michigan Museum oh. of Art. Mm -hmm. And I, unbeknownst to me, I walked upstairs and I saw this incredible <laughs> installation mm -hmm. of fragments from, you know, the 66 um, house. And uh, I wanted to ask you, Nani, what experience have you had in terms of when you first saw that group of things and how it actually ended up being, you know, installed? Because it, it's stunning now. It, it is. They've done an amazing job. Um, Louisine Havemeyer died in 1929 in that house. And 1929 was a rough year, in case you yeah. <laughs> do remember. For many different reasons. And it was also not the moment when the work of Louis Tiffany was particularly enamored. Mm -hmm. So he was completely out of favor, mm -hmm. and there was a, um, a, a stock market crease. So, so the family um, made what was, I'm sure, a very difficult decision. They had, you know, they had already gotten, taken you know, whatever they wanted. And, and let me just, because there's a philanthropic side of things, which maybe mm -hmm. we'll get back to. Yes. Let, me finish, let me finish answering this. So they took the house down, um, and at the time, they, they, there was big, well, I don't know, two or three auctions. Anyway, several auctions. Several auctions, yes. Um, at the time of the American Art Association, and, mm -hmm. and one of them was the house. So literally mm -hmm. everything in the house went up for auction. Mm -hmm. Part of that was you had to remove it at the buyer's expense. Mm -hmm. So... If you're buying the staircase, you have to take that staircase apart yourself, or you have to get somebody to do it. So there's additional costs. Well, amazingly enough, the then dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Michigan, a man named Emil Lorch, got permission from his from the university to go to the auction. And, and by the way, he was already acquiring Frank Lloyd Wright. He was acquiring Louis Sullivan works mm -hmm. of art for the School of Architecture there. And he went and he bought a ton of the house, of the interiors of the house. He bought um, mosaics, he bought the great peacock overmantel yeah. mosaic, he bought the staircase, we don't really know how much. He bought the entrance doors, he bought, um, I can't remember, oh, the chandelier from the, from the library. Well, and, and they put it in the School of Architecture, which was a relatively small building at the time mm -hmm. on sort of one of their main streets. They moved into another building, and, and in the 50s, they sold a bunch of stuff. They deaccessioned, which many museums 
deaccessioning, it was a bad moment for deaccessioning, it was in the early 50s. A lot of important things went off. Um, some of which are surfacing in other ways, which yes. we've, yes, some we of us have been able to yes. <laughs> acquire, and they, you'll see them on the floor in here too. But um, mm. it, not today, the, but in, in years past. But um, and and when I first started at the at the museum, I I was very interested in this material, and actually, one of the Havemeyer descendants wife was very involved in the University of Michigan and she said, oh, well, there's all this Tiffany material there. So I, I got on a plane and went out there. At the time, mm. it was pretty rough shape. Mm. Everything, I mean, the, the mosaic was in the dean's office. That was, that was safe. But the door, which has all this encrusted with beach stones and the like, beach stones were falling out. It was propped up in the, in the basement part of the library. The, the, Chandelier was kind of hung in this modern um, corridor where people were throwing gum wrappers into it. It was really kind of har mm -hmm. scary, horrifying. They were thinking about selling it. There was all kinds of stories. But, but happily, um, under the, uh, the stewardship, well, mm -hmm. wrong, of James Stewart, who was then director of the University of Michigan Museum of Art, and they built a new building, a whole new building. They um, realized how important this material was the art museum and the and the school of architecture got together to to jointly kind of own this material and and they have made a really oh, absolutely gorgeous beautiful installation, beautiful mm -hmm. installation yes. there so it's it's well worth a trip mm -hmm. to see right. kind of helps bring it alive absolutely absolutely yes so i think we have come to the end <laughs> and uh, um, we would invite you to come up and ask us questions, or if there is a burning question that you would like to ask for the next few minutes, I, um, please oh, feel free. That please come up and talk with us individually afterwards. We're happy to answer any questions you have. And thank you so very thank much you. for coming.